Hey, this is Kat. Welcome to Standing in Faith. I'm in the studio with Jeff. Hey. And David. Hey. And this is the uh, fellowship after party for the Standing in Faith podcast. Just an ah, open mic free for all. There you go. That's a good one. <laughs> This is fun because <laughs> we normally don't record this, and yeah. this will give everybody. This is another behind the scenes look here, right? <laughs> this is what happens after we stop recording, and we usually end up saying, "Oh man, I wish we recorded that." Yeah, we were just talking about um, how some people really believe the Bible is the Word of God, and it's what gets them through so much. And we talked about people in China in the past and in the present and the persecution and just how just a page of the Bible or one verse or just what they only had in their minds and hearts got them through and just how much the Bible means to us and then how some people are just like, ah, whatever, give or take, eh, whatever. I don't know if it's true or not. And, uh, and Jeff, you were kind of wishing to do something about this, but feel like you didn't have the chops as like an apologist I'm not. I don't have the. I, I've heard some people, and we were just talking about this. So, um, all this is a result of a, a Barna survey that was released maybe a month or two ago, um, which had unbelievably low percentages. Well, that's not the right way to say it. The, the percentages of people, believers, that thought that Scripture was the, the, the Word of God, the, the divine nature of Scripture being infallible, it was, was shockingly lower than I expected it to be. Mm -hmm. I mean, for me, it's 100%. The Bible says what it is, and it is what it says, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Right? I believe, I believe the things that are unbelievable in the Bible. I've just always taken the Bible to be what it says it is. Um, so when I when I heard I heard an apologist talking about the 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 Word of God being very useful in having a discussion about circumstances and culture and right what's going on around us, but not necessarily being a very good math. It's not. The Bible is not a book about math. It's not for instructing you on math. And uh, I'm, I heard an apologist say this, and I thought to myself, well, you know, I actually think the Bible is a wonderful kingdom math book. Mm -hmm. And kingdom math is maybe not the same as the math that I grew up with or maybe some of the newer fangled new math, which I just don't get, right? But God math, I do get, right? And that is... Not only do you back to reaping what you're sowing, right? But there's there's an exponential response to that which you've planted. That's God math to me. So any, I'm just, I do feel like we should talk about the Bible being God's word. I think it's it's important that we do because once you start dismissing portions and chopping this out and taking this away and, and making it really making it palatable for you. And that's typical what people do yeah. for whatever it is they want to be about or what they want to do. And that's sad. It's kind of like the, uh, this man was dying. It was in his home and he asked the pastor to come to his home. And, um, um, this pastor had come to this church and had been there for a while. And, um, but he was dying and he wanted the pastor to come and the pastor came to his house and he and the, the the man laying in bed said could you uh, read some passages from the scriptures for me and uh, the pastor said sure and he picks up the guy's bible he opens it up and there are pages missing there's big <laughs> chunks that have been cut out of it you know and all that and and the pastor says what in the world happened to your bible he says well from the time you first came um and started to preach, every time you said this didn't apply, this didn't happen, this didn't do this, he says, I would cut those portions out of my Bible. He said, probably by the time, if I had to live much longer, I probably would have just had two leather pieces eventually. Um, I mean, that's a true story, but it, 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 
it you get the point. Mm. Um, you know, it's kind of like building blocks. You start pulling out one out of the bottom, the whole thing topples down. Mm-hmm. And 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 what we say when we talk about the infallibility of Scripture, when we talk about that, we talk about it from the original languages. Now, out of those original languages, there's been tons of different translations. But if you look at them, none of those translations ever take away from the core message that's there Mm -hmm. of the salvation that starts in Genesis and goes to Revelation. It's all woven into it, no matter what translation it is, Mm -hmm. you know, because you got Bibles that are translated into other languages that have to fit the, the, the culture. You might would read them and think this doesn't make so much sense, but it does to the culture. Yes. And but it but even in those situations, it doesn't take away from the 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 core of the message that God is trying to get through to us. And I think that's important. Um, that just because a translation says one thing about a word and other, because yeah, those words have tons of meaning, uh, does not change, and and many times does not even change the context of the story that's being told. Yes. You know, it's uh, I got I got a funny two funny things just popped to my mind. Um, I'm trying to figure out which funny thing to go with. So, um, this is maybe the more relevant story. So the whole idea behind standing in faith to me was ultimately it started with the investigation of a scripture say saying that it was impossible to please God without faith. And I thought to myself, uh oh, right? Yikes. I got to have faith, right? I yeah. need to be pleasing. I, I want to please him. So that to me was the, that got me started because that was what I would call a scary scripture. At least for me, that scared me, right? And like, wow, it's impossible to please God without faith. Well, that was what started me digging into everything that we've talked about here, right? Getting a measure of faith from the Holy Spirit. So in other words, God's given me what it is that I needed to please him. Mm-hmm. I didn't have to work it out for myself. But I guess that's just a funny little story that even some of the harder things in the Bible, I that's forced me to dig into them. Mm-hmm. Another example, um, and then I'll be quiet for a little bit. So... um I remember another part of scripture where it says, my grace is sufficient. I remember having a a conversation with Father God about sufficient, and I didn't necessarily particularly think that was a very good word. Um, And he chuckles at me and he laughs and he's like, well, do you know what it means? And I said, yeah, it's, it sounds like just enough, like sprinkled on top a little bit, right? Um, and he laughed again. He's like, well, you don't know what it means. So he told me to go look it up. And sure enough, I looked it up. And sure enough, I wasn't necessarily, I, I, I was like, oh, wow, this doesn't mean sufficient, like sprinkled on top just enough. What it actually means is to rise up with power, an abundant, uh, an abundant level of power. So in other words, it goes to overflowing. Hmm. which is not sprinkled on top sufficient. So his grace is what allows us... To rise up in power greater than the need. That's what the word sufficient... Our English word maybe is not indicative of not what sufficient. I just described. Not sufficient. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's insufficient. <laughs> Yeah, that's funny. Anyhow, so yeah, even some of those aspects of scripture, right? They force, at least for me, it forces me to engage with it and start to wrestle with it and he investigate it, and learn about it, and ask God about it. I'm like, okay, what is this? I, mm. um, so anyway, I share those stories. Interesting thing is that when you were talking about the mathematic aspects, um, I remember when I was just a young believer, I was listening to a guy, 
Bible teacher by the name of Derek Prince, and some of you know him. Um, <laughs> he was a powerful man of God and, you know, taught the Bible for years. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me, he had his doctorate in, in philosophy and logic and all that kind of stuff from Cambridge and taught there before he went to the war. Anyway, a long story short, um, he got, he was in Africa uh, during the war, got put in the hospital and started, for some reason, reading the Bible. And um, what he said, and this is a logician, uh, he said, I began to realize that the Bible was one of the most logical books I'd ever read. And that's funny. I'd never thought about it being a logical book. But if you ever study logic, you know, and, and the whole breakdowns of it. Mm -hmm. and, and, of course, he was a, he had a doctorate in it. He says, this book is so logical. Hmm. And I thought, that's, that's an amazing insight into a book that's been so, you know, either loved or trashed, you know, in some capacity or other. But I also think that if we had these low statistics that, that, that Jeff talked about of people not really believing it's the, the, the Word of God, the infallible Word of God, what's going to happen during times when things get really rough? Yeah. Because that means that they're dismissing the Bible. They're not even really reading it. They're not really taking it in. And, and um, Kat, you mentioned the whole thing we were talking about about China. It, it's a, in what I was reading is these people would, would memorize, if they even had a Bible, they would memorize huge portions of it so that when they were thrown in prison, they weren't allowed to have Bibles or anything close to it, they would, from, from memory of what they'd memorized, they would meditate on them, and it would carry them through some of the most atrocious torture and, and, and horrible situations that are unimaginable to us as, quote, Americans. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, w what's going to happen, you know, if, if you don't have that anchor of hope um, to, to let God speak those words into your heart that come out of his word? Well, the Bible says we're going to get tossed around, right? Yes, but we'll get tossed around by doctrine. We'll get tossed around by ideas. We'll get tossed around by people, by thoughts, by culture, right? By being correct or what we think is correct. Yeah, you, we'll end up getting tossed all around and then just ultimately confused, disillusioned, disappointed. And the irony of it is we'll probably blame God. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Which is going to lead everybody back to, well, what does the Bible say about it? And then they start to rediscover him all over again. Right. So that, it's kind of, we, we're giggling about it, but yeah, there's probably some truth in that. I think some people um, have a problem with the Bible because it threatens some of their idols. There's a, there's a whole list. I can't think of what, uh, what book it's in now, but it lists all these things put away the works of the flesh, blah, 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 all these things, which are idolatry. Like these, these things are idolatry. So if there's Bible passages or words of God that contradict what they want, whether it's sexual immorality or whatever, it's like, eh, maybe the Bible's not true there, or maybe it means something else. Yeah. You know, this is one thing that I find that's remarkable, and that is... Throughout my entire life, it seems like they've just kept discovering that there are all these archaeologists, right? They're out on these digs, and they keep finding scrolls and remnants of ancient biblical passages and writings. Um, it, it just seems like it's been going on for my entire life that this has been the case, and I guess the thing that's pretty darn remarkable to me is the consistency and what they keep discovering. They're not finding new stuff. They're finding a very consistent, this is the exact same thing this one says. Mm -hmm. And they're finding them in different places by different... To me, that kind of goes back to the very... The, the Hebraic culture of, right, 
shared tradition and not just oral, but writing it down and keeping these scrolls and telling these stories. There's so much remembrance and there's so much, um, boy, now I wish Triple R was here. So there's that, that aspect of their culture that keeps it like documented and rehearsed is the word I want to say, but that seems, sounds funny to me. But Like binding it to their foreheads, writing it on the doorposts of their home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, those are called phylacteries, but what's written on the doorposts is the Shema. The Shema is from Deuteronomy that says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one, I shall love the Lord. Because in that it says, And teach your children as you sit at the table, as you walk on the path, and so forth and so on. So, um, you know, that that's why it was so important in 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 Jewish culture, in Hebrew culture. The word of God, even if it was a, a little piece of it or whatever, was never destroyed. You know, it was sacred. And of course their scrolls are very sacred uh scrolls that they and they treat them with such love and kindness. And when they're read in the synagogue, when somebody reads it, they have to be proofed by others to make sure they're reading it correctly. You know, it's just something around that. There's, I think there's, of course, a legal process around it that, that can be suffocating. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, I think there's also an attitude towards it that's very holy. It preserves it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it preserves it. And thank God that they've, they've done that, you mm-hmm. know, mm-hmm. Uh, over the years. So, you know, and there's religions that, out there that that believe that um, the Word of God is actually, the Bible is secondary to quote the organization. Oh. The organization is first, you know, and it decides how the Word of God works within the organization. Mm-hmm. You've been subject to that. You've seen what yes. I think that's about. upside down. Well, of course it is. That's upside down. But the authority becomes, you know, that's where the authority... and. I remember in seminary, I was asking this this uh, this person. Uh, they were talking. I I said, "What is the authority in your life?" And they responded to me and said, "Reason." And my Ooh. face dropped. I thought, "Seriously? Yeah, reason." Scripture was not the authority. This was someone who was training to be a pastor in a church and so Boy. forth. And and reason. So that means that my pea brain is what's going to determine wow. what's in people's lives and what should or shouldn't and, and, and instead of the authority of God's word. But that was, and what I began to find is there's a whole culture of that, oh. that, that reason and experience supersede scripture and tradition. And, and you may not understand this, but uh, the call, it's called the Western the Western, the Wesleyan quadrilateral, which means when Wesley looked at Scripture or anything else, John Wesley, um, he would look at, he would say Scripture, um, it, Scripture, tradition, experience, and reason, for those four things. But he said Scripture was far separated from the next three things. It was top of the line. He, and he said, always, you know, where where you look at scripture, take it literally, but in gray, pla- gray areas, we have experience, tradition, and reason, but you can't separate that. Mm-hmm. You've got to apply all of those. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with tradition. It's traditionalism that gets, becomes a problem. Mm-hmm. It's when we worship tradition. Mm-hmm. Um, but tradition is the, is the, uh, um, living faith of the dead <laughs> and traditionalism is the dead faith of the living yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> anyway anyway what i was getting at is jesus said remember these things yeah, yeah, right yeah. so that's what i call traditions yeah. remembrance so so when you use those three venues in areas that are gray yeah. you come to some kind of understanding really for the holy spirit really helps you kind of piece all that together and bring you some revelation in it. And what happened was there was an old school back in the early uh, uh, turn of the century that began to separate those two and teach 
pastors in their school experience and reason. Ooh. And and scripture and tradition took a second place. So experience and reason became the 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 thing. You experience it and you reason to it and et cetera, as opposed to the authority of the scriptures of the word. So that's why a lot of that's permeated out there. It's been you know, there there's there's a lot of teachers um quote of the Bible and pastors that have got a lot to ask for one day that have put a lot of that out there and affected the way people think and understand. Uh, and of course it's clouded over. We know by the evil one, he, <clears throat> he knows how to subtly inject that stuff in there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I guess that's, that's interesting that you're saying that I'm just thinking through me personally. I, I definitely know when I've, experienced something then i start to ponder it research it meditate on it see whether it's scriptural and basis or not i don't think i I'm, I'm a heavy tradition guy at least i don't that's not one that i've but i wouldn't suggest that i place i've had some experiences that i'm just really not sure what to do with so they just kind of get stuck on a shelf until such a time as they're either useful or not anymore um but yeah i'm I'm back to how can such a large percentage of the population not believe the bible and i think what you're suggesting or putting out there is they're applying their own reasoning and possibly some of their experience to it. That becomes their God. And in, in essence, their authority, not their God so much, but their authority in their life. Uh huh. That's, and that's dangerous if you think about it, because all of a sudden God's word fits in there somewhere. But my brain that I'm relying on becomes... Uh, in essence, becomes my God. Because I can decide any way I want to, whether something is applicable or not, mm-hmm. applicable or not, or whether it, it works or not. Yeah. I, I've heard it even argument argumented, or right, argued that man wrote the Bible. Right? And, yep, I actually do believe that that somebody had a pen, right, and was writing. But I, I believe that what they were writing was inspired, divinely inspired. Sure. Mm-hmm. sure. Right? That it was not their writing, but, right, here, here this is fine, the Holy Ghost writing through them. Yes. Well, I had an old Hebrew professor. I love the guy. He knew 27 different Semitic languages, and he taught Hebrew really well. And... There's something he always said. He said, you know, he was one of these guys that, that, that demythologized the Bible, which is horrible, but took, took all the miracles out and everything. Mm. Um, but one day he made a statement. I never forgot it. He said, um, he said, you know, if I did believe in miracles, he says, there is one miracle. And that's how this book has been preserved as well as it has for thousands of years. Mm-hmm. I mean, that was an amazing statement to me mm-hmm. yeah. that 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 he could say that, you know, and I thought, yeah, that is it is amazing, and and especially when you think about everything that's in it, the historical side, especially a lot of the Old Testament historical side, and all the different things that that Jesus did, you know, and. I mean, and even those are a small segment compared to what, like John says, it, it, if we wrote all the books about Jesus and what he said and did, it'd probably take up all the books in the world. You know, he was basically exaggerating, but mm-hmm. uh, it would be a lot more than just 25, 22 or whatever chapters. Yeah, yeah I, I just go back to thinking about, right, something compelled the disciples to write, to write down their experiences, Mm -hmm. right? Something compelled them to come together 
So Jesus said, hey, go wait in the room, right? But they, they stayed unified for a long time, right? Something compelled that and something compelled all of those things to be written down in something compelled Paul to write all the letters that he did, right? And so that, eh, to me, it just goes back to it was divinely inspired. Yes. It had to be. All right. Good. Are we out of things to talk about in terms of Bible? <laughs> <laughs> it kind of felt like all of a sudden we hit a low. <laughs> Party's over. And... <laughs> okay. I, then there you go. There you have it. This I'm is what th- happens I'm, I'm, after. I'm just thinking, like, I guess people just have to decide. Choose this day wh- who you're going to serve, like your brain or God. Like, it's just a choice. And until people choose it, then, I don't know, you can't convince people because they're just going to, I don't know. It's, it might be a little cynical way of looking at it, but if you don't humble yourself like a child, and that means admitting that your brain is not superior to God's brain, then, I don't know. Well, why don't, why don't we come up with a challenge here, right? This is the Bible 30-day challenge, right? Believe it 100% for 30 days. For everything that you need for 30 days, go to the Bible. Find it in the Bible and find out what the Bible says about it and then do whatever the Bible says. And see if it really is the infallible, desi- divinely inspired Word of God. That's a good challenge. Now, I'm, honestly, what do people have to lose? It's it's a book. Yeah. Right? People read, I mean, diet books all the time and yeah. try to do the diets. Yeah. So why don't you do the Bible challenge and read the Bible and do what it says and then, right, see what happens after 30 days. And if if it's gone well after 30 days, do it for another 30 days. Mm-hmm. See what happens. Yeah. Find out when it breaks down. That's the challenge ultimately. Mm-hmm. When does it stop working for you? Yeah. Where do you want them to start? I have no idea. I just that just popped into my head. The Bible challenge. I don't know. Start no. now. No, no, no. We're we're in the Bible. Oh, oh. Start. <laughs> yeah, probably wouldn't be a good idea to begin in Leviticus or something like that. But maybe the book of John, the Gospel There's of John. There's some good little nuggets in every book. Every book there's always nuggets. So yeah. You can find Jesus and you can find grace yeah. everywhere. Every yeah. book, yeah. Uh, uh, I I've recently had okay. a friend John. Uh, Starting the book of John. John's Sorry. good. John. You recently had a friend. That- uh, a friend who was like, yeah, the New Testament is good, but it's the Old Testament. And, you know, I heard this theory that it's a different God from the Old Testament <laughs> and the New. And, you know, it's just different. And I don't know. You know, it's just the Old Testament. I just have a problem, you know, and he's just so mean and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, well, um, he was like, you know, if I came on your podcast, that's probably what I would say, you know. And I was like, well, I think that that idea just comes from not actually being familiar with the Old Testament. I said, because there's so much oh, mercy yeah. and love of God all throughout it. I think it's just I think it's just people who just haven't read it enough. And he was like, uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> hey, if your friend wants to come on the podcast, we got a mic. That's right. <laughs> the green mic is open. Yeah. <laughs> I'll let him know. Good. All right. We're done. Hey, bless y'all. Bless Thanks you. for hanging out with us yes. on the behind the scenes. Amen. Sure would appreciate your feedback. If you enjoyed today's episode, please click like or rate us with five stars and be sure to leave a comment. If you have not already subscribed, please do that as well and turn alerts on. This way you'll automatically know when we post our next installment. You have our permission to share this podcast. If you have a story you would like to share or a question we can answer, you can email us at fellowshipcast7 at gmail.com. That's fellowshipcast7 at gmail.com.